I have, a, I have a shoulder bag that I'm quite fond of. And this shoulder bag that I have over here, I've become fond of for all sorts of reasons I don't particularly want to go into at the moment. But the shoulder bag is endlessly irritating because I have to leave for work very early in the morning and I have to get onto the subway very early and I desperately need coffee when I get onto the subway. But unfortunately, when I try to drink the coffee, the shoulder bag slips and I throw the coffee in my face. Now, I'm so attached to this shoulder bag and I refuse to put it down that it seems as though every morning I'm spilling this coffee all over me uh, by the action of letting the thing slip and throwing it in my face. Until such point as the other day I was standing on a platform and I heard some people who were gathered, because it is very early in the morning, near the entrance, and I heard them talking and looking at me and saying, that's the man over there who throws the coffee in his face. <laughs> now, if only I would get rid of the shoulder bag, it's highly likely that I would not throw the coffee in my face for the entertainment of the people standing on the platform any longer. But my obstinacy in insisting upon this shoulder bag uh, apparently is going to ensure that the same thing is going to happen day after day after day. The reason why I'm telling this story is not simply to begin the lecture with something like this, but because there's a point that I'm trying to make in various lectures that I've been giving for groups like Fidelity Forum and for Dr. Mara. And that point is that in the modern world, and by modern world I mean the period of time which has started with the first attacks on Christianity in the 13 and 1400s, that Europe and then all of the areas dependent upon Europe have been seized with what I would call a principle of contradiction. And what that is, is that I mean that they are so fond have become so attached to a particular idea or set of ideas that no matter how many times this idea or set of ideas leads them into actions which are either ridiculous or are dangerous or downright destructive to everything that they do, they nevertheless remain attached to them. If they were to change, if they were to change the idea or set of ideas and return back to a Christian framework of looking at things, then they would find that many of their problems would disappear. But the obstinacy of the attachment is too great, as mine is to my uh, rotten shoulder bag over there to the right. In other words, in the modern world, people have become so fond of one particular idea or set of ideas which are anti-Christian in character, and these ideas are so wrong that the more they think about these ideas and the more they follow these ideas, the worse everything gets but they will not question the basic presumptions that are leading them to all of these mistakes. We can take any number of issues and look at this and see how this operates, but it, today what I want to talk about are two which are connected, one being the idea of war, and then the other being the idea of the warrior, or the soldier, if you will. I would argue that in the modern world, with the sort of ideas that influence the way in which modern people go about things, they have a notion of war and the way in which one deals with war which leads them into exactly the opposite kind of conclusion and result than they want it to lead them. And they have an idea about the warrior or the soldier and dealing with him that when they apply it leads them into exactly the opposite kind of conclusion that they want it to lead them to. Whereas if they got rid of this idea and they were to return to a Christian framework of dealing with things, they would find out that the approach towards war and the approach towards dealing with the warrior or the soldier leads them to exactly the sort of thing that they would like, namely peace and quiet. In other words, Christianity is such a sensible notion, in addition to being the truth supernaturally, that the more one follows Christianity, the better they are. And the problems tend to be that Christians don't follow generally what it is that they believe, so that they fail miserably like everyone else. Whereas, again, with the anti-Christian notion of things, ironically, the more one follows them, and the more sensible people are with regard to them, the worse everything is. All right? Christianity's problems tend to be from not following Christian notions, whereas the problems of the modern world, unfortunately, tend to stem from following exactly what it is that people hold to be true. Now, again, I can't go into a long description of uh, the various things that distinguish the Christian view of the world and the non-Christian view of the world, but we all know really what they are, and they will come out 
basically in my discussion, this twofold discussion that I'm going to enter into today about war and the warrior. So let's simply begin by looking at the question of war and trying to explain, using one particular historical example from the Middle Ages, what it is that Christianity did with war and why it is that I feel that Christianity, therefore, has dealt with war the best way that war can be dealt with. I'm not going to discuss the concept of just and unjust wars because I'm sure that Dr. Mara is going to be entering into a discussion of this after I'm finished today. But let's just start off with the basic notion that we're all aware of that there is in Christianity the obvious realization that there is such a thing as sin. And that no matter how much people deal with the question of sin, in the current condition of mankind until the end of time, there will be no end of sin. Sin is always going to be with us, and sin, since sin is going always to be with us, that means there are always going to be people who are going to be unjustly violent, and that there are always going to be people who justly are going to have to take up arms against them. But we'll leave that to Dr. Mara to deal with later on. What I want to mention here now is simply that admitting this fact that there is such a thing as sin in the world Christianity and the Catholic Church have dealt with this problem as realistically and then ultimately as successfully, I believe, as it can be dealt with. And I want to simply talk very briefly about a kind of long-term development that took place in the Middle Ages to try to illustrate my point. As you all know, Europe itself was invaded at the time of the collapse of the Roman Empire over the period of the 300s, 400s, 5, 6, 7, 800s AD, by wave after wave after wave of really very nasty people. Some of them were less nasty than others, but some of them who were very nasty were not the sort of person that even a mugger in the middle of the night would particularly want to come across. They were different types of tribes of people, most of whom now lie at the basis of the different European nations. And at their nastiest, they were these lovely sorts of people like the Vikings, about whom endless stories can be told, such as, for example, the fact that when a warrior died, uh, his wife, left, uh, left alone without protection, was then raped by every other member of the tribe, strangled by the elderly women of the village, set on fire, and dumped down a river. All right, these were not the nicest people of the world, uh, and therefore they, these are the sort of people who inundated Europe and with whom the church had to deal. All right, this is not, again, the sort of, the sort of problem that one would like to encounter. It's, uh, in a way, even worse than the problem that certain teachers have to deal with with their students at the present time. Now, the point I want to make is the following. When these warriors, when these soldiers from different barbaric tribes poured into Europe, these, these warriors did not know how to run a government. In fact, even at their best, when they tried, they made every kind of authoritarian structure, every kind of legal structure, everything left over from the Roman Empire, even at their best, they made it crumble because they did not know how to make it work. In fact, what they tended to do was instead of allowing for a government to watch over peace and order in the whole of Western and Central Europe that they inundated, they tended gradually to carve out, in ways which are too complicated at the present point to describe, they tended to carve out little, little spheres of influence in which each warrior, ranging from the least powerful to the most powerful, was able to play his warrior games. Some of them were very great warriors, some of them were lesser warriors, but all of them were united in one thing, that they liked war. And in liking war, they made sure that Europe, for certainly during the period of the 8 and 900s, was a kind of hellhole of constant warfare. A hellhole which was constantly being attacked by those Benedictine monks who were left in Europe and who were able to offer some kind of resistance to these people, uh, and offer resistance even to the corruption that such people allowed to enter into their own monasteries. 
You might know that, for example, a lot of these warriors need land on which to survive and to get enough surplus to be able to provide themselves with a horse and a suit of armor and a sword. And the church had land, and oftentimes what they would do is they would run into a monastery that had land attached to it and announce to the monks that they had been given a new abbot, Abbot Igor or Abbot Spike or whatever abbot uh, might, might come from among this tribe of warriors, who is now going to be looked upon as the supposed enforcer of the rule of St. Benedict, but who is really simply going to look upon the monastery as a giant means of providing an arsenal for war. So that there was constant warfare from France down to Italy, through Germany, in bits of England. Certain parts of Europe managed to escape this. But the bulk of what becomes the cradle of the Middle Ages and medieval culture was devastated by it. Now, eventually, in one of the most brilliant transformations from a period of despair to a period that built the brilliant culture of the Middle Ages, the church managed step by step to pull itself together. And it managed step by step to do this chiefly through the activities of monks who somehow found a kind of magic formula to unite what had previously been independent monasteries, very weak on their own account, together into one firm whole, which, because of the sanctity of the monks that lived in these monasteries, created enough of an enthusiasm and respect in the poor trampled-upon population of Europe, and even the poor warring, constantly warring uh, soldiers or warriors that had come in from the outside of the Roman Empire, they had managed so to impress them, and so to inspire respect in them, that these monks, starting from a small kernel of one or two monasteries, gradually reformed the monastic life of Europe and saw their influence extending down to reform bishops and even popes who had fallen on very nasty days at the same time period, so that Christianity, by the late, by the 1000s and 1100s, began to shine forth in its older glory and see its mission to civilize these barbarians much more clearly. Now this really leads me to the specific aspect that is of concern in this section dealing with war today. The realistic way in which the church, once it had put its own house in order and staved off the corruption that the encounter with these people had uh, really inevitably caused it, what they did, what they tended to do was something like the following. If we had a monastery which had began to gain, begun to gain a reputation for having holy monks in it, this monastery in a given area of Europe would become a center of pilgrimage, let's say on a, uh, any major feast day of the year, but let's take an Easter or a Christmas. And everyone from the surrounding area would come to the monastery in order to hear the holy monks preach. So there would be a mass, and there would be a festival, and there would be, at the Mass, listening to the sermon, the bulk of the common people, the clergy, and then also these warriors who were present, who were entertaining themselves by continuously fighting and causing trouble for everyone around them. Then these monks would stand up there and give a sermon such as the following. What is authority? Authority is something that has come down from God. What is that authority supposed to do? It is supposed to provide for the common good. Who is it who holds authority over us at the present time? These bums over here. Right? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing in order to hold authority over us correctly? No. They're raping. They're looting. They're burning. They're destroying any kind of peaceful life which is needed not only for agriculture, it's not only needed for merchant activity, it's also needed to be able to pray properly. And it's destroying their souls as well. So if I had any ability to influence these people over here who are going to rot in hell, if they don't continue, the, if they don't stop this activity, if I had any way to influence them, I would certainly make it clear that I am not pleased with this at all. So what would tend to happen at these gatherings is that the serfs, knowing that there, the, the, the peasants or the other people gathering, knowing that there was going to be uh, a, a call for peace, a call for settling down, a call for doing with authority what authority ought to do, 
These people would appear usually waving branches, olive branches if they could get them, uh, branches of willow trees, branches of any kind of, of, of tree, and crying out, peace, peace. Now, let's go to these warriors over here who were standing off to the side. Some of these warriors were themselves impressed by the preaching. Some of them. Some of them were impressed uh, to the degree that there's one account that I know of, of a famous preacher in northern Italy, who when he discovered that a local warrior was about to go out on the rampage again, would simply walk over to his, his, his place of residence, knock on the door and stare at him. And once he would stare at him, the man said that he would get so nervous and shiver that he would stop what it was he was planning to do. Some of them were like that. Some of them were were so much like that that in fact it was a warrior like this who first allowed the little niche in which Benedictine monks could begin the whole effort at trying to reform themselves and put monastic uh, life in order. There was one man who allowed them a little monastery and space of land where he did not bother them at all in France to do this. But the bulk of them were just like bombs anywhere, in the sense that they did not want to hear what they were preaching. They had no intentions of following what they were preaching. But lo and behold, they knew that there was no honor among thieves to a certain degree. And they knew that this preaching could convince one of the other warriors who was there of something like the following. He could say to himself, my goodness, he could say, the next time that my friend over here goes on the rampage and acts up in a way that displeases the monks who have such an influence over the population here, why should I have that monk's influence and the population's hatred aimed at me when I can stand up and say, I will defend the cause of the peace against this evil man who has not listened to your wonderful words, even though he has no intentions or, uh, of following them if he, ha- if he could get away with it in his own right. So that each of these people sitting off to the side there starts to know that they have to watch a little bit because of the fact that the greed and the ambition of their neighbors who are also dangerous warriors, could, hypocritically if you will, be disguised into simply appearing as being defenders of the cause of peace, so that they could perhaps turn their ire against the man who would break the cause of peace and gain what kind of loot they would like by appearing to be the defender of the peace. Now, under the worst of circumstances, and I'm not saying that uh, they would do this because... It would create the impression that we're talking here about a kind of proto-liberation theologian, which is not the case at all. Uh, under the worst of circumstances, these quivering warriors here could also know that the holy monks, if they had the desire to do so, could so rile up the population at the Mass or at the festival that they could make their lives dangerous. Now, these monks did not want to do that. These monks wanted authorities to act the way authorities ought to act, properly for the common good. But, nevertheless, there was always that knowledge that that could happen. So what tended to take place all through Europe, starting in the late 900s and in the 10 hundreds, was that at ceremonies such as I have described, the monks would make these warriors take an oath. And they would take these oaths in groups, And the oaths were called either things like the truce of God or the peace of God. And in these oaths, these people did what modern people tend to think is rather silly. Because rather than saying, I will not fight anymore, the monks made them take an oath like the following. They would make them take an oath that they would not harm people who were not themselves engaged in fighting. They would not harm the clergy or merchants or peasants or women or anyone who was helpless in any way. That they would limit their fighting so that they would not fight during Lent, or Advent, or on major feast days. Or as time came about, I think it was something like from Thursday evening until Monday evening. So that the purpose of their their, their, their whole approach was to try to limit warfare, to subtract certain groups of people from the warfare. And if these people want to slug it out, Let them slug it out among themselves. All right, the gist of what I'm arguing here is that we have got, in the mind of these monks, 
a realistic approach, a Christian realistic approach, because they know that they are not going to drive sin from the hearts of these people. They know that they're not going to do that at all. They know that they're not going to be able to attract everybody by a kind of perfect contrition to fighting for, to, to, um, to stopping their warfare, but they will attract some so that they keep the idealism of their message going. But they also know that realistically, they can have each one check the other, they can have each warrior watch over the other, and they can limit the times and the places and the brutality of all of the conflicts that are taking place. And then if the opportunity were to come up, as it does come up, starting in the ten hundreds, in places as distant as the Holy Land and Spain and even England, what they could do is somehow or other direct these people away from this senseless fighting that they're, that, that they're involved with, and aim the fighting at a general protection of the borders of Christendom from attacks from those people who are anxious to destroy it. In other words, in the crusading movement. All right, now, in contrast to this, in contrast to this, in the modern world, where we have this principle of contradiction at work, where we have the people who are attached to an idea as silly as my insistence upon carrying my shoulder bag with me, even though I throw the coffee in my face every morning, where we have this principle of contradiction and anti-Christian view predominant, we have people who insist that there must be some way to do away with sin entirely. And in the minds of these people who are aiming to do away with sin entirely, the idea of realistically limiting war, the idea of realistically aiming warfare onto a purpose that might be good, as, a purpose, as opposed to a purpose that is intrinsically evil, doesn't enter into their heads. Because all sin must end, the key to ending all sin must be right at our fingertips, and they are insistent that they are going to find it. The result has been that the modern world has been filled with more and more and more destructive wars that have dragged in more and more innocent people have dragged in more and more property damage uh, as well as lives and have ended up by destroying both the victors and the vanquished. One has only to really look to see the kinds of wars and the kinds of weapons that people who have been um, fanatically attached to the idea that war could come completely to an end have been responsible for. We have uh, endless examples that we can even give from American history about ranging from the Civil War down to the present, where even a man such as Lincoln, who was, uh, who was committed to the idea of ending war and detested bloodshed as much as was possible, and who wanted desperately not to fight anybody, ends up justifying the use of all kinds of brutal weapons, which rip the flesh apart uh, and destroy the body in, in, in ways which uh, Europeans repudiated and never even used in the First and Second World Wars because the thing would end more quickly. All right, the result tends to be that it doesn't end more quickly uh, and then, in fact, rather than, rather than limiting warfare, it, it takes us all into it. The First World War is another instance of this in which we entered the war supposedly to end all wars and as a result of ending a war to end all wars, we, in a way, helped engender more bitterness and more anger at hypocrisy that helped to create certain preconditions for the next outburst, which was ended by the use of another weapon, uh, which was supposed to perhaps end the war more swiftly, uh, which devastated a country which we then immediately began to want to rebuild, to build a, a weapons force to fight off the other force that came into the picture, which was supposed not to be there as a danger because we were going to bring sin and wars to an end with the Second World War. Then there is the idea among these people that to fight a war for something as elevated as religious ideas or a crusade would be the war that would be the most stupid and senseless of all. Because to fight for something that is itself supposed to protect a religion of peace like Christianity seems to these men to be a contradiction in terms. What tends to happen when you say that you can't fight wars for something like a religion that is anxious for peace 
And that you can't fight wars for the sake of the ideas which are enshrined by Christianity means that since you are not going to end wars, the wars are going to be either fought for senseless purposes, for simply brutal ambition and greed, and that more often than not, after Christianity has introduced, introduced the idea of paradise into men's minds, you're probably going to fight wars for non-religious fanatical ideas, such as Marxism, or such as any of the ideologies that have infected the Western world since the French Revolution, which are going to be even more brutal than anything that took place uh, when Christianity predominated in the world. So that ending wars entirely, when there is such a thing as sin, leads usually to its opposite, and not fighting wars for the only purpose, which it seems to me that you could find a justification for, for protecting the peace, and for protecting what brings the message of salvation into the world, leads you to fight wars for mad purposes, or for utterly fanatical purposes, such as Marxism, or something uh, similar to it. Now that's just discussing the concept of war as such. Because, but there's another thing that's involved in this. There is the concept of the warrior. And I would like to spend the rest of the talk today mentioning something about this. Now, let me just begin by, let me just begin by mentioning that there is a certain type of person that is a kind of warrior mentality. There is a type of person who likes books. There are types of people who uh, generally are the, the, the kind of nature that will, be, that will have a vocation and will be attracted to a life of prayer. There is a type of active individual who is not attracted to a life of prayer or to a life of books who will be anxious for trade. And then there is a type of person who wants to use his body uh, and wants to use his body in some sort of vibrant exercise. Now, all through the history of mankind, these people have found an outlet in war. These people have had a certain, I don't want to use the term violent, but they have had a certain tough streak in them. I have students who are like this, and I don't mean this in a nasty sense now. I mean, I have students who are fighters, and they are not dangerous people. They are simply people who are anxious to develop their body and who, once they develop their body, are vigorous in their activities and therefore are anxious to let out the energy in some way that, even in sports terms, appears to me too much. But there is this type. What are you going to do with this type? Are you going to tell them they can't exist? Well, this is hard. Because all through human history they have existed. And as we'll see in a minute, if you tell them they can't exist, you don't get rid of them. You simply transmute what it is that they do into something else, which is dangerous in the same way that when you try to end war entirely, you don't end war, but transfigure it into something which is more dangerous and senseless. Now let me go back to these people who invaded Europe in the 400s, 500s, 600s, 700s, 800s AD, the various tribes of Germans and the Vikings. When these people gave an indication or an illustration of what a warrior type was like, they thought about it only in the following terms. A man who is a warrior is a man who can handle a horse properly. A man who is a warrior is a man who can sit on a horse properly, fight properly on a horse, and take care of his horse properly. In fact, the whole word that ultimately then is changed in meaning by Christianity to indicate the way of life of these people comes from this fact. That horse in one of the Germanic language, uh, the, the tribe's languages, the tribe of the Franks, the word for horse is cheval. The way of life of the horseman is chivalerie or chivalry. Except in this time, it simply meant being able to sit on it and swing a battle axe properly and lop limbs. Now, even in the way in which a man was recognized by the tribe as a warrior, you saw this roughness. Because all that would happen if a man had done a good job, a young boy, let's say, had done a good job on his horse, is that the chief of the tribe would come over after the, the battle was over and give him a big smack on the face. 
and say something which uh, figuratively translated means you're a tough one. All right, which means he would be accepted as a warrior. What does one do with this? Do you tell them no, no longer? It's time for you to go to the public library? Do you tell these people that it's time to simply go swinging on ropes or playing football? They're not the sort. So what you have to do is find some means of taking the Viking warrior, the Germanic warrior, the tribesman, and turn him into the Christian knight, the Christian warrior. You have to find a means of taking chivalry, which means simply the ability to swing a battle axe properly and rape and loot. You have to take that and transform it to the point where it means chivalry in the sense that most of us in the room probably know the term. You have to take that and transform it into the kind of thing which is ultimately described starting in the 10 hundreds and through the 11, 12, 13, 14 hundreds in a type of poetry which was known as the chanson de geste, all right, the song of the deed. Poems which described how it is that a Christian warrior ought to act. And these poems describe for us the way in which the monks, starting with the Benedictines that I mentioned administering these oaths of the truce and the peace of God, continuing through the work of the papacy, finishing to a certain degree, even in the work of a man like St. Francis of Assisi, who tries to give another dimension to the life of the Christian knight by his, his commitment to his lady poverty, as he calls it, we see in these poems the transformation that took place over several hundred years. Because right from the beginning there was a transformation. There was a transformation of the ceremony that made a man into a warrior so that it no longer became simply a smack on the face. It became a preparation. It became a fasting. It became going to a mass. It became saying prayers. It became a sort of uh, ascetic preparation which ultimately then led to a man being declared a warrior within the context of a Christian ceremony in which he would kiss the Gospels in which he would swear a more elaborate form of the original truce of God and peace of God, in which he would declare that he would protect the weak, that he would protect women, that he would protect the church and merchants and the peasants and others. Now, there is an element to this which I cannot describe in any other way than by simply once more asking you to remember if it is not the case that you could see the, the glory of this when things happen to you, say, in your own life, and say, for example, you've come, you came across in your own life, or you even watch in a film or something, an incident where there is a, a weak person being somehow brutalized. And then a man who looks like, perhaps he looks like just a brute, I don't know, it's just tough, might not even be that intelligent. Let's say for the, for the, for the, um, uh, for the purposes of my argument that he's downright stupid. All right? But has brute strength. What a glory there is when, say, you see in your own lives or you watch in a film, a man like this willingly submit his own intelligence and brute force to the cause of the defense of this person who is weak. So that what in itself would be a horror if you saw the stupidity of this man leaping onto someone and beating his brains out in a way becomes something which, which evokes in you a pride and a desire to want to shout for joy because you see him defending the person who can't defend himself. This has happened to all of us. Uh, whether when a child, when seeing somebody who is stronger protecting a weaker person, or as I say, well, even when you see somebody coming in to save threatened individuals from evil people, whether criminals or whatever. And that is what is happening and being enshrined here in this concept of the development of the Christian knight. Now, I mentioned that all of this is described in poetry, in this type of poem called the Chanson de Geste. And you, you all know what these poems are, even if perhaps you don't know the term. They're poems like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They're poems like El Cid. They're poems like the Song of Roland, which describes the way in which Charlemagne's army is dealing with the Saracen, the Muslim Saracens coming up uh, through Spain uh, after 
one of Charlemagne's efforts to try to deal with them did not work. All of these poems tend to depict the Christian knight, but now, in a way, indicative of a certain change which has taken place, which is even more significant, than, well, maybe not even more significant, but also instructive in what I'm trying to describe here. That we have poems like King Arthur and the round, Knights of the Round Table discussing the way in which a King Arthur and Sir Lancelot and others behaved in the 500s A.D., Now, we're talking about literature which is usually written in the 11 and 12 and 1300s and 1400s A.D. What does this demonstrate? This demonstrates that the Christian knight or the Christian man knowing what will appeal to the Christian knight in the 11, 12, 13, 1400s is aware of the fact that he does not want to hear any longer that his ancestor in 500 was not the sort of man that is depicted in this chanson de geste. He wants to make believe that his great, 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 great ancestors had the same Christian ideal that he does. And the literature describes this then. This is extremely significant. It's significant because it demonstrates the fact that the Christian warrior now has become a man who has a certain model for his behavior. And again, that model ranges from taking the oath to protect the truce and peace of God to considering as a symbolic gesture of merit spending your time as a warrior going on the search for the chalice that Christ used at the Last Supper. Because he's got that model and because he is embarrassed at the behavior of the warrior before he became baptized in a way, we have taken then an immense step towards limiting and guiding warfare. Why is that the case? Not because of the fact that these people, these Christian knights, are once more going to live up to what the image is that they ought to do for most of the time. Because just like human beings everywhere else, uh, many of them are hypocrites. Some of them even dislike this model. Many of them will never lift a finger to do anything for it. But they now know they cannot justify any other kind of behavior for a warrior other than the kind of behavior that is described in this type of poetry. And this type of poetry is utilized generation after generation after generation to raise up new Christians and new Christian warriors to the point where they no longer even know that their ancestors could even have dreamed of being different than the way in which their model depicts that they ought to be or even were. All right, what is therefore the significance of this? The significance is that the warrior's life was raised maybe not much above what it had been. But in the whole history of the world, raising things that much is so much of a triumph that it helps to transform the world. Because Christianity and Christian behavior may only have transformed the world that much. But that tiny little fraction of an inch of elevating the tone has enabled us to develop endless kinds of, of, of institutions that have made life not only more palatable, but the only way in which life can be properly enjoyed in the world. And not only that, of course, has given the possibility of salvation afterwards. It takes so much to get human beings to move one inch that if you can make them move one fraction of an inch, you have achieved an enormous lot. It took me something like ten years after I first wanted to go to a concert to realize it was permitted for me to enter into the hall to buy a ticket. Why? I don't know. Inertia. And it's the same thing with anything else, and it's even more difficult when you're talking about something that involves sin, like war and the life of the warrior. Once more, and this harkens back to the point that I made at the very beginning of my talk, if a German warrior or a Viking warrior from before Christianity got hold of him thought about his model of being a warrior he must become a worse man. But if now a Christian knight thinks about the model of becoming a Christian warrior, he must become a better man. And everything lies in that. 
Just as everything lies in that with Christianity as an idea, as opposed to all of the hypocritical, contradictory, and I would say because they're contradictory, demonic ideas that have seized hold of the Western world since the decline of Christianity. Now that brings me then to this point, and I'll be closing up really with this, really. Well, there's one, uh, one concluding image I want to give to you to conclude with, but let me just finish this point here. What happens when you deal with the way in which the modern world would like to deal with the warrior? And that is abolish him entirely. Abolish the type of the soldier entirely. Ridicule the type of the soldier entirely. You can't do it. And as a result of trying to do it, you get one of two possibilities. You get either the possibility that the soldier type starts to realize that he is outside of the law. And in being outside of the law, he has no rules. And in being outside of the law and having no rules, he can now once again do anything. This is part and parcel in a way of certain aspects, certain aspects I say here, of the fascist mentality. All right? uh, certain aspects of this uh, indicate that there are no rules any longer and it is up to the man of force to simply make the rules he wants to make. Now, on the other side, I would say that by trying to deny the type of the warrior, you also, in a funny sort of a way, get the complete degra- you get a continued degradation of society. Now, how does that happen? In the following fashion. The Middle Ages, in its, its glory, understood that there has to be a class of people to protect certain ideas with the force that only an institution and a class of people with certain traditions in common can do. So that there was a class of merchants who protected the hard-hearted need for making figures properly, for supplying people properly, and for trying to achieve prosperity. There was a class of people in the clergy who were devoted to the supernatural that reminded everyone that this hard-hearted merchant-type activity was not the only thing that there was in life. That there is the supernatural, which is the ultimate important thing. And then there was the warrior, enshrined in the noble class, who told people that there is such a thing as glory. Now, there's all problems with that word that I can't go into here, but nevertheless, we all know that there is such a thing as honor. And there is such a thing as glory. And there is such a thing as, as, as meaningful activity on the part of the government in protection of its citizens or whatever, which, if you destroy this class, will not be protected, even by the clergy to a certain degree. So that the result of the medieval understanding of this was to give each of these three, with the church at the top, a force that made everyone aware that a human life was a combination of, first of all, direction from the supernatural, secondly, understanding that a human being was a creature that had to seek honor and glory, and then thirdly, that you also had to take into account the hard-hearted facts of daily living. But you get rid of one of those groups, the other two cannot really make it on their own. And by abolishing the type of the soldier, of the warrior, what has happened in the modern world is we have no one that institutionally, as a class, protects the idea of, let's say, the nation, protects the idea of the glory of the nation, that protects the idea of patriotism, for that matter, that protects the idea of the way in which the man should should build his body for the defense of the weak. The other two groups can't do that. And if I had time really to go into it, I would discuss today the fact that I do not think that it is any way an absurdity to argue that the, that the continued growth of such things as homosexuality in the world today is partly, partly the result of the unwillingness to admit that men, to a certain degree, have this desire for honor and glory and the warrior mentality that must be Christianized. Because if not, it is doomed to cause disaster. Now, to end the talk, I simply want to refer to a point, to a, to a, to a, a work of art. And this work of art that I want to refer to is a work of art which I think demonstrates what 
Christianity has done with both war and the warrior. And that work of art is a work of art by a German artist, Albrecht Dürer, who uh, made many engravings, certain paintings and the like in the early 16th, late 15th, early 16th century. Dürer has a work which is called The Christian Knight. Right? And this thing, some of you may have seen it, um, shows, depicts a man who is on a horse. And the horse is the proudest horse that you could ever imagine. And this man is as straight as a board on this horse. And he is enshrined in his, in, in his armor. And he has a look of tough determination on his face, which is a look not of the brutal man, but simply of the man who knows where he is going. Where is he headed? Well, in the distance in this work, you see a hill. And up on the top of the hill is the heavenly city. Right? It is Jerusalem, or the, the, the new Jerusalem. And it is far in the distance, and he's only going to reach there through hard work. Now, because of the type of person he is, his hard work is going to involve fighting. And you can see in this work the sorts of things that he is fighting, because the painting is filled with them. There's all kinds of nasty demons sticking their heads out of the woods. There's a a, a Satan there who's trying to tempt him away. There are creatures biting at the legs of the horse. It's filled with the kind of thing that always made, at least for me, camping a rather rather unpleasant experience when I was a child. All right, but does the horse care? No. Does the Christian knight care? No, because he is aiming towards the heavenly Jerusalem. He has been told by the church what it is that he has to do. He knows what his job is. And he is going to go there by the look on on the face that you see by not harming those who do not deserve to be harmed. If he goes astray and thinks about what Christianity has told him about war and his mission, he must put himself back on the proper path, unlike the man who is not the Christian warrior. If that image is destroyed, and if the kind of person and the kind of approach towards warfare that in a way this painted, this, this work is one illustration of disappears, then the Christian knight will not reach the heavenly Jerusalem. In fact, along the way, wherever it is that he is going, he is going to enter in league with the demons and devastate the land around him. And if ultimately he does reach this city on the hill, it is going to prove to be not heaven, but hell. And he's going to drag all of us along with it. Thank you.